Hey everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanic.com here today with a special guest in studio and we're going to be talking coolant. This is episode 85 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. Like I mentioned, I have a special guest in studio. This is Mark Malone from CRP Automotive, and we are going to be talking coolant. Mark, welcome to the uh, the new studio, man. I appreciate you being here. Charles, thank you so much for allowing me to be a guest on your show today. Yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, we're going to be talking coolant, but before we dive into the coolant world, tell us uh, tell us a little bit about CRP uh, Automotive and Penison, to be more specific. Well, CRP Automotive was founded in 1954 as a gateway to North America for European manufacturers who were looking for a presence here. We started with the Continental tires. We were bringing in boatloads of the Beetle tire for Volkswagen, and we did that for a good 30 years. Wow. And at that time, they moved over to work with General Tire. When they went with General Tire, we started handling their V-belts and their fuel line, and of course, the, uh, like the famous 95 by 905 belt. Very Eventually, cool. we needed to have other manufacturers to represent. And in 1983, Penison was introduced to us through Volkswagen, who they were looking for a logistics supplier in the United States. It would have been tough to supply coolant uh, to the Beatles way back then, I, I would imagine. That would be a hard sell for... Uh... Definitely. For an air-cooled Beetle, it would have been next to impossible, but you never know. <laughs> well, that's cool. Well, let's, uh, let's dive into this coolant world. So... For those that maybe don't know coolant like at a molecular level, can you just give us like the, the 3,000 foot view of what coolant is? Right. Okay, so this is the basic makeup of concentrated coolant or antifreeze, which we'll go into a little bit later. First of all, you have 85 to 95% ethylene glycol. This is to prevent the freezing and for the overheating. The second part is the inhibitor. This is the special sauce and is from 5 to 10% of the antifreeze. And then lastly, you have water and the anti-foam. So when you hear the word coolant, um, you know, there's, there's two kind of common sayings. Some people call it coolant. Some people call it antifreeze. Is there any difference between the two? I use coolant just because that's what the bottle says of, of the, uh, you mm -hmm. know, what are we on, G13, 400 pluses now or something like that. Um, I use coolant, but I know there is a lot of people that, that do use antifreeze. Can you tell us right. kind of the difference between the two? Well, it's a little bit like what came first, the chicken or the egg. So you have your uh, water-cooled engines came out. So the first uh, invention was to cool the engines with water. So they had water and they had some lubricants in there for so the engine. So that's where the coolant portion comes so from. that's where the coolant portion came from but as a result of course uh, they started finding that it was freezing in the winter so what did they do they came out with an antifreeze they found ethylene glycol was a good antifreeze and they started adding that to the coolant so it was a two-part mixture you'd put in your coolant and then you would add your antifreeze and eventually it evolved into one product so, we, so what you're saying is we have it really tough today that we don't have to mix anything. We can just pour it right in. We don't have to dash of uh, coolant, dash of antifreeze, a little bit of water, and we're good to go, right? That is correct. The only thing you would have to do is probably mix your water, which everybody knows. But other than that, no. It's the coolant or the concentrate is already ready to use. So you can call it either one, but it was coolant before it was antifreeze. Correct. So, Mark, you mentioned mixing your coolant, as we are probably just going to call it throughout the rest of the show, mm -hmm. with water. Can you use any water, or is there a proper water that you're supposed to use? And if so, what is the proper water to mix with coolant? Okay, that's a great question, Charles, because quite honestly, most people are still using their tap water, running their hose out to their car when they're mixing 50-50 with their antifreeze. This is totally inappropriate because in the United States, in Europe, we all have hard water. So you say, what is hard water? Hard water is the mineral that's in the water. The minerals that are in the water, that's what creates hard water. The more minerals, the more chance of developing rust and corrosion in, in your engine. So what we recommend is DI water or deionized water. Deionized water is reverse osmosis and it takes all the minerals out of the water. You can buy deionized water at any of the retailers. Yeah. Worst case scenario, you can use distilled water, but distilled water also has minerals in it. So you basically want to remove all of, I don't want to say all the junk because all those minerals are important to water like right. when you drink it, but you want to remove all of the things that aren't vital to the coolant's performance to prevent Correct. What, would you, what, what are you preventing when you, when you use deionized water versus well, you, regular tap water? You are preventing the corrosiveness that's going to cause the rust. Okay. That's so this basically is a, what a you're rust taking. issue. It is a rust issue. It, is also, it also will help your um, antifreeze, your inhibitors, to last longer as well. 
Um, inhibitors do dissipate over time. That's why you're changing your antifreeze. Right. So what happens if I have a bit of a coolant leak and I can't find deionized water? I don't want to buy just the, uh, the universal coolant, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. What can I do just to basically to get me home? Okay, if you just need to get home, put some water in the okay. car. So a to, little to regular your... tap water or uh, bottled water is better water? than... Right. It is better than... An uh, overheat condition? <laughs> well, it's better than putting in an antifreeze that's not meant for your car is what it's better than. So put in some water just to get you home. Uh, the other thing I recommend is carrying uh, an extra bottle of antifreeze in your trunk. I have my go bags in my car for when I want to go work out somewhere so I have it ready to go. You can do the same thing. You can have a quart of oil in your car. You can have uh, the, the uh, antifreeze in the car, whatever you need. That's great advice and yeah. probably a whole other show we could do. <laughs> right. What to keep in the trunk what, of your car. Yes, that's a good show. So there's so many coolants out there, Mark. You, you go to the auto parts store and there's an entire aisle and it's this one has this, this one says this, but my car manufacturer says only use this specific coolant. What's the difference between all that stuff you see at the auto parts store and the stuff that I go down to my local Volkswagen dealer or AKA mm. for me, the parts department mm. and, and buy a gallon of? There are all makes all models antifreeze out there and then there's vehicle specific. All makes all models antifreeze is 96% ethylene glycol and 2% inhibitors versus the 5% yeah, inhibitors right. of vehicle specific. So even that small difference, you know, when, when you look at 100% and five, 3 to 5% difference, that's, I mean, that's where the magic happens in that small percentage difference. Uh, and, and quite rightly, two per, think about it this way. The inhibitors are the most expensive part of the antifreeze. So someone who puts in 2% inhibitors versus a company that has to put in 5% inhibitors, yep. right, there's a cost savings. So that's one thing. The other thing is it's less corrosion, corrosion protection using 2% inhibitors. You can see the different inhibitors that are being used out there. There are two types of inhibitors. There are inorganics and then there are organics. You've heard HOAT, hybrid organic acid technology. A hybrid organic acid technology is a package of one inorganic and then the organic acid technology. Here are your inorganics. You have phosphates on top, you have the silicates, you have the nitrates, and you have the borates. The phosphates are for Asian antifreeze. The reason the phosphates were developed in Japan is because Japan has very clean water and phosphates react poorly with hard water. So as a result, all the Asian cars were developed to work with phosphates. You have silicates. Silicates are the inorganic that is used in the European cars because in Europe they have hard water, much like the United States. So silicates were the popular in inorganic used in their antifreeze. Then you have the organic acid technology, which came later on. And then you have the nitrates. And organic acid technology can be used in most vehicles, but they like to be used in conjunction with an inorganic. You have your nitrates, which are a very old conventional antifreeze from the 70s and 80s. And then you have your borates, which was for cast iron. And that was also from the 70s and 80s. The borates can be very rough on aluminum. With vehicle specific, you can see that they use one inorganic with organic acid technology, be it phosphate for the Asian, silicates for the European. With all makes all models, they like to use a little bit of each inorganic. And by doing so, they are causing some corrosion because they, do, they react poorly with each other. So that's an awful lot of things that go into proper coolant mixtures and proper application for, for coolant. What can happen if we use the all makes all models coolant or even if we just use the wrong coolant in our car? Like I was explaining <laughs> in the last chart, <laughs> when you do mix your antifreeze uh, with something that it's not called for, or if you put in the wrong antifreeze, the wrong vehicle specific fluid in the wrong car, you can get different reactions. You can get the pitting of the water pump. You can get rust formation in the radiator. And here you can see an example of a heater exchanger and then one that is developing uh, corrosion. Now, the one thing about antifreeze and corrosion, it usually takes about a year to happen. So if you go to your mechanic who works on your vehicle and he puts in an antifreeze and tells you he added coolant, you should ask him what coolant he added. I think these pictures do a really good job of showing just how much damage can be caused by you know the nitrates and the borates. I think you had mentioned to me that the borates are really the thing that that breaks down the metal 
um, right. especially like in this water pump picture. And I have actually seen cars with radiator issues like this um, due to you know the wrong coolant and then so much junk right. gets built up and then settles in the bottom of the radiator. So now your car overheats right. or it springs a coolant leak depending on you know really how bad it was. It's true. The borates are probably the worst of the inhibitors, but it goes back to the 80s and 90s when it was cast iron and you needed to have the borate for the cast iron. However, the borates will eat up the uh, aluminum. Mark, when you were talking about um, CRP a little bit at the beginning, you mentioned a really long history with Volkswagen, which is super cool. Um, and Volkswagen has had a lot of different coolants from you know, the mid-90s with G11 to what we have now, which I jokingly said G13 with like 700 pluses on it. But can you talk a little bit about the transition from G11 to where we're at today? Sure. So um, Volkswagen has always liked to uh, keep improving their antifreeze, and they've made an effort to do that every two to three years at the beginning. And that was also because technology of antifreeze was changing. So let me grab my props here behind you. So as you say, the NF came first, and the NF is your G11. So you Volkswagen enthusiasts, you probably remember the G11. It's I blue. actually have a bottle, two bottles of it in, in my cabinet over there. There you go. So the G11 was a conventional antifreeze. It had no, um, it was nitrate free, that's hence the NF, but it had silicates in it for the hard water in Europe, and it actually even had some borates in it. Eventually, Volkswagen said, wait a minute, organic acid technology is coming out now. We want to have organic acid technology, and we want to get rid of the nitrates, and we want to get rid of the silicates, and we want to get rid of the borates, and just have organic acid technology. So they came out with the SF, or the G12. So the G12 came out. Eventually, they tweaked the G12 a little bit, still the same product, still SF. They even kept the same part number, and they called it G12+. Plus. Eventually, what happened was they wanted to have an HOAT, Hybrid Organic Acid Technology. So they wanted to add the silicates back in with the organic acid. So the G12++ plus plus was the premier antifreeze because it had your um, silicates and it had your... Uh, organic acid technology, so it was an HOAT, a true HOAT. Then, to really get you confused, they decided to go to a G13, which is the Penafrost E, and the Penafrost E is actually backwards compatible, and E stands for Europe, so the Penafrost E, which is a G13, had about 80% ethylene glycol in it, and it has about 5 to 7% glycerin in it. The glycerin is, works as a cooling and a heating, just like ethylene glycol does, but it's more uh, environmental friendly. So what Volkswagen was doing is creating an environmental friendly antifreeze called G13. It's interesting with advancements in all these other technologies in a vehicle, you know, things like coolant kind of get, get put on the back burner, but it's cool to, uh, to know that not only technologies in the rest of the automobile have, uh, have improved, but coolant as well. Well, that's a, that's a pretty cool history and uh, a lot of stuff that I didn't know about right. <laughs> Volkswagen coolant, which is always fun to learn. And actually, there's a lot of information here on the back of the uh, Penafrost bottle that talks about some of the same things right. that you had mentioned as well. I'd, I'd like to mention the size, too, because people sometimes say, what, what do you do with one and a half liters? Well, Volkswagen is full concentrate, so you have to cut it 50-50. So this is one and a half liters. If you cut it 50-50, you're basically getting three liters of antifreeze is just shy of a gallon. So that's basically why they do it this way. The 50-50 mix gives you a minus 35 for cold weather. Um, people often ask that. That is a law in the United States. That antifreeze has to meet at 50-50 minus 35. So being a dealer tech, one of the things that I don't want to say frustrates me, it's more of a confusion thing, is, is why there isn't a service interval Mm -hmm. for coolant, among many other things. But you can see over the age of the vehicle that the coolant tends to change color. It goes, you know, with the G13s and the G12s, a very, very bright, vibrant pink, purple color to a very, it almost looks watered down. Mm -hmm. Does Penison and do coolant in general really have a, a service interval? For uh, Penison, we do have interval changes, okay? So there's long life antifreeze and there's super long life. Long life and, it, and super long life are pretty much based on the inhibitor per percentage that's okay. in your antifreeze and the breakdown of it. So the NF and the SF is considered long life. So that's about 60 to 80,000 miles okay. that you should be changing. I mean, that's still a long time to have to worry about, yes. about a, a replacing the coolant. 
And then your E or your HOAT antifreezes are super long life where you can go up to 120,000 miles. But we probably would recommend people changing around 100,000 okay. miles. So 100,000 miles, that's also about a timing belt interval. So that's kind of a good time to, to pile it all on and get a full fresh load of coolant when, when you replace your timing belt. Or if you're on a timing chain engine like you know, a lot of new Volkswagen Audi engines, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the brand has gone that way. Uh, 100,000 miles is, is kind of a good, uh, right. good recommended interval because they're all going to be on the, uh, right. on the uh, super long line. And it's interesting that you should mention the timing belt because obviously at CRP Industries, we also represent Conti. So we have the timing belt kits, the Pro Series kits that probably a lot of your audience has seen. Mm -hmm. What we've started to do is we're putting um, now a slip of paper in all our timing belt kits that show you the proper antifreeze for that timing belt kit. So if it has a time belt kit with a water pump, I should say. Uh, so if you take that time belt kit out, you change the water pump, it's telling you what antifreeze you should be putting in as well. So we talked a lot about coolant, and one thing I wanted to make sure that I mentioned too from a dealer tech standpoint is that we see mixed coolant, not a ton, but a fair amount. And it's usually that situation where someone panics and they, they're at the auto parts store mm -hmm. when their coolant light came on or they're driving by and they pull in and they grab whatever the, the guy says that's okay to use. Right. They pour in, you know, whatever, a liter of, of this coolant and now we have to go back in and flush it out. And it's actually pretty expensive to do that. Rarely do we get it all out in one flush. And you, like you mentioned, if it's going to take a year for some of these, these effects to start to happen, we may not know the long-term impact of right. this until down the road. So... I think the key is make sure we're using the right coolant or antifreeze, whichever you prefer to call it. Right. And uh, you know, if, if you're not sure, call your local dealership, read your owner's manual, and right. uh, make sure you're using, using what, uh, what your car requires. And if you uh, are interested in the Penafrost, you can go to showmetheparts.com and look by year, make, model, year, and it'll tell you which antifreeze to use. All right, guys, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Mark, thank you so much for joining me in studio today. I really appreciate having you here. Um, if somebody wants to learn more about CRP and Penison, have you got some resources? I know you right. mentioned showmetheparts.com. Anywhere else? Right. If you go to CRP Automotive and also on showmetheparts.com, you can also go to penison.net. You can get all the product data sheets on all our products. You can get the SDS sheets um, if you need them, the safety data sheets. And you can also download our catalog. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. If you have any questions or comments, post them in the comments section below. If you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. Both Mark and I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at homomechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously here on YouTube. And check out crpautomotive.com and showmetheparts.com. Correct. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.